Okay, so welcome back. Um, so now the second talk for today is by uh, Pontel Tuta. Uh, it's called, it's about exponential gap finding your keys for border depth three circuits. So you start whenever you're ready. Yeah, okay. So hello everyone. So uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, exponential gap uh, finding hierarchy theorem for border depth circuits. So this is a joint work with Nitin. Hopefully Nitin is there, I don't know, but hopefully he's already there. Anyway, so, um, so here is the outline. So I'll, so uh, Nitin, I think on Monday gave a fantastic talk on uh, introduction, introducing the border depth circuits and some results. So I'll not waste too much time on basic definitions and terminologies, but what, for the completeness, I will just you know skim through some of the definitions that is required for the talk. I'll not waste that much amount of time in the definitions. And then I'll go to border depth circuits, what is known, what is not known, then I'll state the result we have. Then I'll eventually try to sketch the proof of k equal to two, I mean, fan in two case, and then I'll conclude, okay? So feel free to stop. And if you ask, I mean, if you have any questions, please I mean, just ask me. Okay, so let's start. So, okay, so uh, the basic computational model is the uh, algebraic circuits. And you, uh, this is the uh, graph where you have nodes at the bottom where they are just variables or uh, constants from the field. And in the edges, you are, I mean, you're allowed to use any constants from the field. Essentially, this means that you are multiplying four. So, this is 4x1, and there are a bunch of addition and multiplication nodes in the in the in this circuit and ultimately you compute a polynomial f so what is the size of the circuit it's the size of the graph number of nodes and edges and size of the polynomial f is basically the so one and there can could be multiple circuits computing the same polynomial f so you take the minimum size of all possible circuits that is my size f and we'll be eventually talking to about depth three. So this is depth three actually. So longest path from top to bottom to top is three. <clears throat> okay. So, and what is determinant? Determinant is, uh, 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 symbolic determinant is basically the way obviously uh, you, you have known uh, I mean, from class 11, 12 that you just take plus minus. This is essentially sign of the permutations and you sum over all the permutations from one to one to one. So uh, determinant is essentially universal in the sense that if you take any polynomial F, it can be written as a projection of determinant. By projection, I mean, in the entries, you can you can uh, write linear polynomials, polynomials of degree less than equal to one. And since you, this is universal, any polynomial can be computed, there is a minimum dimension of the matrix. And the minimum dimension of the matrix is determinant of complexity. For example, if you look at this monomial x1 up to xn, this has determinant of complexity n because you can just put uh, all the diagonal xi's and it cannot be less than n because the degree does not even match. And once you have de defined the determinant, you can define the algebraic class, complexity class called VBP that will be required. That's why I'm defining it. So what is VBP? It's set of all polynomials. So it, it has all polynomial, uh, all polynomial families where the polynomial family, what is the feature of the polynomial family that uh, Fn has uh, determined the complexity bounded, polynomial bounded. Okay. So now, uh, yeah. So once you have defined this, let's uh, define border complexity. So for any major gamma, we can analogously, I mean, sort of canonically define uh, border complexity uh, as follows. So suppose you have a measured gamma, let's say size, circuit size, or let's say determinant complexity or anything. Now you uh, take a bunch of polynomials H epsilon, where epsilon is some parameter, such that you know gamma of H epsilon is, is equal to N, and you also know that the limit of H epsilon is that polynomial H. So then we say that gamma bar, border complexity of H is less than equal to N. Okay. So using gamma, you can define the border complexity gamma bar. So for this talk, I'll just talk, I'll I'll just be considering approximative circuits, which is 
which is essentially so i'll, I'll just uh, use that algebraic definition this was defined by Woodley. but okay so what was what is algebra uh, what is approximate circuit so the same circuit definition you take the uh, the circuit i defined but instead of in the ages you, you are now allowed to use any arbitrary uh, epsilon uh, functions i mean rational functions so for example one by epsilon cube epsilon by epsilon cube plus one anything like that you are allowed to so this is like uh, cost free there is no cost uh, let's say using uh, this epsilon one by epsilon now ultimately you are calculating a polynomial uh, over the function field f of epsilon okay so now uh, we want to understand the limit of this g okay so in particular uh, for the time being assume that it's a polynomial in epsilon and uh, the degree of epsilon is let's say m for the time being and i want to understand g0 the epsilon to the zero coefficient so what can you say about g0 remember we are given the circuit of g where we are essentially saying that my epsilon is set of cost free but they are being used everywhere in the circuit so the obvious attempt is you just put epsilon equal to zero, right? So why not just put epsilon equal to zero? And the problem is that if you put epsilon equal to zero, it may be undefined in the circuit because you, you may be using one by epsilon or one by epsilon cube in the circuit. So that may not be well defined in terms of circuit, but ultimately as a polynomial, it is well defined. So the G zero as a polynomial exists, you know, but it's not clear how to get G zero from G. So this essentially sort of shows that uh, G0, the epsilon to the zero co coefficient of the limit is something really non-trivial. And we want to understand the complexity relation between G0 and G. Okay. So once you have seen this uh, definition, uh, uh, this, uh, this approximate circuits, let's define the formally, what is algebraic approximation? This is by the research that's from 2004. And uh, so a polynomial H, we call it has approximate complexity S. If you have a circuit computing G and uh, G is of the form H plus epsilon times S. In other words, limit epsilon times to zero G is H. So you have a circuit computing G over this field of epsilon, meaning epsilon are free of, uh, free of cost. And you want to understand the, if, uh, the epsilon equal to uh, the epsilon to the power zero coefficient so that is a so we call that h as approximate complexity s okay so what is known it is obvious that we, we write this as approximate complexity of h as size bar border okay so size bar of h and size bar of h is less than equal to size s because obviously h can be just trivially written as h plus epsilon so you can just think of g as the age circuit itself but of course it can be size bar can be actually really less and that's uh, that's where the uh, subtlety uh, lies and if you remember uh, the definition of g how i did so the epsilon degree can always be shown like exponentially large okay by basic kind of argument uh, degree bound so you can think of then the uh, circuit computing G as a polynomial in X and also in epsilon, where the degree of epsilon is exponential in S. Right, so that's what I said. So you have G as G I epsilon to the I, I equal to zero to M and M can be like exponential in S, the epsilon degree. And I want G zero. Now, of course, note that G zero is H, H, right? Because that's the epsilon to the zero coefficient or limit epsilon tends to zero G is essentially H. Now, how can you uh, get H? So I can just randomly evaluate M plus one many distinct points and then just interpolate. And this will give an exponential upper bound in terms of, so size H, so it will be like two to the, I mean, such a lot of exponential in S size H will be. So then it shows that it is sort of size is sort of sandwiched in between the exponential, you know, the lower bound and upper bound are sort of exponential, at least for the general circuits. But of course, the question is, can we say something better? 
and for what kind of restrictions can you say better and so on. So, yeah. So now the, for the last thing, I just want to uh, recall this border wiring rank definition because this will also be required in some sense. So this is another measure. So just like size bar, approximative circuit, you can also define border wiring rank. What is border wiring rank? So you want to write H as sum of powers of linear forms, and then you take the limit. So you take Li, homogeneous linear forms, and then you take limit epsilon tends to zero, the smallest s such that you can write h as this this set of powers of linear forms in the limit is the border wiring rank and when li's are non homogeneous we write this depth three diagonal border okay this is a this is a, this is a notation this is called depth diagonal circuits without i mean if there is no border, uh, bar then this is just depth three diagonal circuits now there is a bar so border depth three diagonal circuits and just for the completeness, just to give an example, you can see that border wiring rank of x to the d minus one y is two, since you can write x to the d minus one y as this kind of expression. Okay. Okay. So, um, any questions? I hope uh, there is no question. Uh, okay. So, if there is no question, let me continue. Okay. So now we want to understand. Uh, depth three. So the, the talk is about depth three, lower, uh, depth three, border depth three circuit lower bounds. But uh, I mean, one question is, I mean, why are we even looking at depth three lower bounds if we don't even understand depth three? The question is, do we understand depth through up depth to upper bound or lower bound results? And uh, the point is, yes, we know because of the following fact that if you look at the sparse, this, this is like a sparse point. I mean, you take a sparse point, I mean, you, you border it, you close it. That is the same class as sparse. And if you look at product of linear polynomials and then you close it, that means you take the bar border to say get the same class product of linear form. This is not really hard to prove. This is by induction on variables, and this is just you can just play around and extract epsilon powers out and just show that this is true. Now, if this is the case, then uh, there is an obvious uh, lower bound for depth two circuits. So determinant is irreducible. So that's why you test it cannot have pi sigma bar circuit. It is exponential sparse, so it requires exponential size sigma pi circuit bar. So obviously we have depth two circuits, lower bounds on border depth two circuits. So once we know border depth two circuit lower bounds, let's move on to border depth three circuits. Okay, so now I'll go to border depth three circuits. And I'll talk about some known results. What is the problem? Uh, some results in classical, and then I'll talk about why. What is the problem in lifting those uh, bounds in the border, and then eventually I'll state our result and we'll sketch it. So, what is uh, depth three circuit? Just for the completeness. So, we say depth three circuit with often in K is denoted as sigma pi sigma sigma K pi sigma. And what do they compute? They compute sigma uh, uh, sum of product of linear polynomials. Remember, this is linear polynomials and not forms. So I am talking about this, this might not, may not compute homogeneous polynomials. The no, not necessarily we are talking about homogeneous. It can be any linear polynomials, okay? So they are in the non-homogeneous business as well. This is just, a, uh, you know, because it, usually in the border, you, uh, people talk about homogeneous forms and so on. So I just want to make it clear that we are talking about the three circuits. There is no non, there is no homogeneity here, as you know. Okay. So once we have defined what is sigma pi sigma, or we know what is sigma pi sigma, and okay. So another point: what is the product fairing is the maximum of di. So you take, so there are sigma and there are different different product weights as can as can happen as well because this is non-homogeneous. It is allowed that you can take uh, different different product uh, fan gates and your product fan is essentially the maximum of the product gates. Okay, so now the first question, how powerful are depth three, depth three constant fan circuits? Okay, are they universal? In the uh, So by universal, I mean that can they compute any polynomial? Okay, uh, you are allowed, let's say for the time being, you are allowed to even use exponential product fan or something. Are they universal? Just like, uh, circuits are generally universal. You can uh, compute any polynomial as a circuit. 
right? So it might be exponential size or something, but so similarly, I'm saying our depth T fanny, top fan in constant circuit is universal, okay? And there is an in, interesting impossible result known and for this interesting in our product polynomial. So you just take X dot Y, X one, Y one plus dot dot X, X K plus one, Y K plus one. So this is a two times K plus one variable polynomial, but degree two. So I claim that you cannot write this as sigma pi sigma with top n in k, regardless of the product fan. Even if you allow, let's say exponential in n, I mean, there is no n, I mean, let's say exponentially k or something like that. So this will be k. So even if you allow, I mean, arbitrary product fan, I claim that you can never write this polynomial as k plus k many, you know, sum of product of linear polynomials. Okay. And in fact, the same holds if, if you replace this by determinant polynomial. I'll, I'll sketch this because this will be important. Uh, the proof will be important because this will sort of sh show us why border is really weird and powerful. So I'll just, in the next slide, I'll just sketch the proof. But so I just want to uh, give you a minute to understand what is happening. So I'm saying that sigma pi sigma with of n k circuits are not universal. And there is a simple polynomial, this inner product polynomial x1, y1 plus dot dot xk plus one, yk plus one. This you cannot write as some k many sum of product of linear polynomials, no matter how, how large your pi get is. And the same proof hold essentially holds for determinant. So, uh, Pranjal, okay. uh, I mean, uh, if the product fan, uh, a silly observation, so if the product fanning was two, then clearly this is impossible, right? Uh, but uh, but you're saying that we, even with arbitrary product fan, this is impossible. Right, right, exactly, exactly. That is the case. Yeah, yeah. for two, it is if, if obvious, but I'm saying that allow every, anything. Like, I don't care what you are allowing. It is not possible. You will not be able to write it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is it clear? Yeah. So, um, so let, let's go through the proof case because then that will sort of clear the air why what is happening and why it is sort of intuitively true. And let's just try to prove this for determinant that I, I want to prove that determinant cannot be written as this. Okay. But I, this, the same proof will hold even for x1, y1 plus xk plus one, yk plus one, we'll see. But so let's say I, 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 I assume that determinant can be written as sum of k many product of linear polynomials. So now the idea is, you pick from T1. So the first, from the first product of linear polynomials, you pick one L1 and you consider uh, this ideal generated by L1 and you take mod I1. So what happens is that this T1 vanishes. So it essentially LHS becomes K minus one sum of product of linear polynomials where of course, determinant mod I1 is something, but it is non-zero. Of course, you can show that it's non-zero and you keep repeating this process each time. So then next step, you take some L2, which is independent. You have not, picked. you put it some, in some new ideal and you go on. And ultimately after K steps, you'll see that uh, this guy LHS has become zero. I mean, if from everything you have picked something, while determinant is so robust that just picking k many polynomials, linearly independent polynomials, and taking the mod that ideal it cannot vanish it. And now, if you think of this in terms of x dot y, x k plus one times y k plus one, what is happening? There are k plus one many these products sort of things. And if you take k many polynomials and make it zero, let's say, what is ideal? Ideal mod ideal means it's, you are making k constants to zero. I k essentially has k many polynomials, linear polynomials. So essentially think of this as you are making k many constants and saying that, okay, I want them to be zero. Now uh, making k constants cannot vanish this x dot y polynomial when there are k plus one many things. I mean, two times k plus one many variables. This is that robust, okay? So uh, what does this prove? So of course, sigma pi sigma with constant and constant k and polynomial size circuit, let's say, now you talk about polynomial. Okay, just for the timing, you never assume anything about the product gate. If you look at the proof, you never assume anything about the product gate. So product gate can be already. Okay, so now if you look at polynomial size 
top fan in case circuit sigma pi sigma of course this has a small formula and of course that implies it has small abp so this is trivial in vbp but of course as you said determinant cannot be written as this so this is a strict sort of uh, separation of these two classes right so now of course the question becomes how about the border class because we know in the classical there is a separation what about the border class okay so is the question clear what i am asking i am saying that in the classical there is obviously separation can we do the same in the border class so any questions in this slide okay so uh, i hope this is clear yeah, this is i mean this is not a really hard proof but this is a very interesting sort of way to look at this proofs okay so now once you have uh, uh, established this let's move on and let's say let's first see how powerful can be depth depth three i mean top i mean constant fan circuits now remember we already saw that uh, just in the slides we saw that classical depth depth uh, this depth three uh, fan in case circuits are not universal there are polynomials where you cannot written even if you allow your exponential product fan or something right so this is not universal so the first question is uh, is it even is it sorry uh, is is the proof for this inner product similar to the determinant proof yes Maybe yes simpler yes, yes yes Yes, yeah, okay. uh, I don't know, but essentially the same proof works. Essentially, yeah, if you okay. look at this, and then you essentially show that it cannot vanish. Ultimately, determinant mod i k is cannot vanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, as I said, uh, we know classical depth three constant fan circuits are not universal. Now let's try to understand what is border of this. Now, just as to recall, what is the definition of sigma pi sigma k bar you have a g where g is computed as sigma pi sigma which often in k over this function philip epsilon and you want to understand the epsilon to the zero coefficient of g so then h is in this bar bordered sigma pi sigma k so here is an interesting uh, a very strong uh, sort of theorem which shows that uh, this classical intuitions, uh, uh, I mean, can fail horribly in the border, in the border complexity. So it says that you start with any n variant degree d polynomial, you have so it can always be written as depth three with top n in two circuits in the border. But the catch is that at least the proof. The way the proof goes, the product finding is exponential, but that's fine. It, you can still write it as sigma two pi sigma bar. That essentially shows the difference between classical and this, because classical you know that there are, I mean, I mean many polynomials where you cannot write in this bar, no matter how your product finding enlarges. But in the border you can. So this shows already how powerful border the three and two circuits can be. So now, once we know this, the obvious question is, I mean, can we rest restrict our, our case to polynomial size circuits? Remember in this theorem, uh, what essentially is, uh, Minal, is, uh, Minal Kumar is showing is, any polynomial P has border depth three fan in two circuits of exponential size, because your product fan is exponential. But now let's just try to understand uh, polynomial size circuits. We want to really restrict ourselves to polynomial size circuits, meaning the D, capital D should, let's assume this to be poly in ND. So what are these circuits? So again, the question is, I know sigma two pi sigma bar is universal for exponential product finding gets and so on, but let's con consider product finding to be polynomially bounded what can we say about this? And uh, so this last year we showed that if you restrict yourself to polynomial size circuits, then sigma two pi sigma bar is inside VBP. That means you there is it, it has a small circuit complexity, in fact, determinant complexity. 
you can always write it as a uh, small determinant projection of small determinant okay okay so uh, and this result holds for arbitrary constant k i mean if you you can uh, replace this two by any constant k and the result still holds okay so again i'll just reiterate the theory because essentially this from the, this from this point i will try to lift the differences and so on so uh, the point is if you start with sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuits where you allow pi product fanning gets to be arbitrarily large exponentially large then you know that any polynomial can be written as that but we want to study polynomial size circuits so you want to study sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuits where let's say this is size s then what is the exact complexity of this suppose f is a polynomial that is computed by sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuit of size s what can you say about its exact complexity and we showed that it has a small determinant this means that this class in inside vvp and this holds for arbitrary constant k in, in i mean if you just replace the top one in two so once we know this let's try to go in the lower bounds or separation kind of setting so now as i said the last we said that we showed that sigma pi sigma bar with of n constant k is inside vpp so now the point is can we separate them are they really equal or they are separated now Uh, recently i mean last year this breakthrough came by lima senevas and tevanas where they showed that imminent requires super polynomial size depth three circuits right and their proof is essentially a rank based proof and usually rank based proof is can be lifted in the border because essentially you use the fact that uh, tensor i mean tensor rank and border tensor rank for two essentially are same so any proof which is rank based lower bounds in the classical can be lifted in the border so the same proof goes through that essentially implies that that we know that dep3 i mean a, a determinant or I mean, in imminent which is inside vvp cannot have small dep3 circuits so it requires super polynomial size so there is already a super polynomial sort of separation but of course the Sorry, point uh... is Ranjit, yeah. so what you are saying, this will show that even if you allow arbitrary constant depth and take the border, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, this uh, iterated matrix multiplication is not in the border of constant depth, right? Yes, 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 okay. yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now, uh, so once you know that, so know that this is a super polynomial sort of X separation, but of course we want something more so the first question is can we show sorry, an exponential sorry, gap sorry just to clarify uh, so uh -huh. because uh, you are only restricting the fanin not the depth because this is a depth three circuit no because i'm just going back to what arkadev asked right right uh, yeah so he uh, seemed to say depth k but that is not what we are what you are saying you are saying if i give you so I'm, if the fanin is k and that is a constant no but actually this proof works so they showed that imminent cannot i mean request uh, oh, okay, super polynomial like depth constant depth circuits right constant so that depth, implies so that that implies border okay. yeah that implies that even border depth uh, border constant Correct. depth circuits yeah okay, so okay. that uh, also okay. sort of implies yeah Correct. so once we know the super polynomial sort of separation uh, we want something more as i said and we want to i mean we eventually want to show that there is an exponential gap between the two classes okay so can we show that and in fact a more ambitious goal should be can we separate even this finer classes fan in k and fan in k plus 1 so this is a finer separation remember and the first question you could ask i mean why should we even expect or why should we even look into this now remember if we remove the border we already know that this is true these two classes are separated why because if you look at x1 y1 xk plus 1 yk plus 1 you know that oh sorry there should not be any border 
sorry is this this there will not be a border so we know that x1 dot y1 plus xk plus 1 dot yk plus 1 cannot be computed by sigma pi sigma with of an border not border uh, with in the classical setting so we know that if we remove the border we know that they are separated in the classical setting so of course this question makes sense because i mean then the point is can we even show that for in the border but the catch is now, if you look at the same polynomial x1, y1 plus xk plus 1, yk plus 1, then interestingly, it has a small depth, depth 3 fan in 2 circuit. In fact, you can show that essentially this follows again from the Minal's proof, where he showed this universal result, universal versatility result. If you just sort of um, imitate the proof but write this as a sum of powers, then you can show that this holds. So, this is interesting now. So, then this polynomial does not does not work, right? So, and that really becomes now challenging. So now the question is, does it hold? And if at all, if at all, how, what is the polynomial and so on? So there are tons of questions you can ask. But I hope the scenario is clear. So you want a finer separation between K and K plus one. And I am already setting that there is, this is known in the classical setting. So you just want to, Sort of show the similar thing in the border. But now the candidate polynomial x1 y1 plus xk plus y1 yk plus 1 does not work in the uh, does not work simply because it even has a small depth c fan in two circuit. Forget about k. I mean, this is so this simply does not work. So what does work? And then of course, how to even prove this kind of stuff. Okay, so any questions? Uh, then, then I'll go into the proof, uh, just theorem, and then what is the problem, and then the proof eventually. But I hope that till now this is clear, right? Okay. So uh, then let me state what we really prove. We indeed proved that there is an exponential gap between sigma k plus one pi sigma bar and sigma k pi sigma bar. In particular, we show that there is an explicit invariate less than n degree polynomial such that if can be computed by this k plus one to n in approximate circuit of orders of size order n. But if you want to calculate if as a to n in k, then it requires exponential size circuit. So this really shows that there is these are these two classes are exponentially separate, not just separate. Okay, so is the, is the theorem clear? So we are showing that there is a polynomial f which can be computed by a k plus one of any depth three circuits in the border, but it cannot be computed by or okay, not cannot be. It requires sigma k pi sigma bar circuits exponential size and without even the delay just just give the polynomial what we will be working with this is almost like this in our product but you just expand this product by a little bit and you say that i my i'll talk i'll take this polynomial pd which is the 3d variable d degree polynomial x1 xd y1 yd z1 zt and note that pd has a trivial fan in three depth circuits and of course, that implies that, I mean, it has a classical fan in three depth circuit. So of course, this has a uh, in the border. But we will show that PD requires exponential size sigma pi sigma bar circuits. OK? So uh, now this is sort of an optimal result that we are getting. Why? Because if you. If you imitate Kumar's proof, it will show that PT, this polynomial, actually has a sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuit of 2 to the order d. This pi gate will be 2 to the order d. And we are showing a 2 to the omega d kind of lower bound. So this is really optimal. So this is, we are really showing what optimally one could prove that there is a polynomial, this is PD, which has a trivial fan in three circuit, depth three circuit, but it can not, I mean, it, 
if at all it can be computed by sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuit it it has to be exponential size there is no other way and you know that it can be written as this is like an optimal result that we are getting and i just want to again uh, reiterate the fact that in the classical classical setting it was about impossibility we knew that there is a polynomial in sigma k plus 1 pi sigma that cannot be written as sigma pi sigma k pi sigma okay no matter how your product gets in the in the in the border there is no such impossibility because of this minimal minimal's proof that sigma 2 pi sigma bar is depth depth free finite two circuits are universal this border depth free finite two circuits are universal so there is no impossibility as such i mean of course if you if you keep increasing your product get you will eventually be able to write but the question is i mean what about the optimality and we say that okay I mean, yes what kumar actually shows this is exponential and eventually this has to be exponential there is no other way so then we essentially this shows that this k plus 1 and k border they are exponentially sort of separated so then you really get a hierarchy sort of thing that sigma 1 pi sigma bar is exponentially separated from sigma 2 pi sigma bar exponentially separated from sigma 3 pi sigma bar and so on this is like a hierarchy that's why we call this hierarchy theorem okay so i yeah so any questions till this uh, uh this slide so this is the crux of this uh, talk so let's i mean if you have any questions or any thing then just feel free to ask otherwise i'll just uh move into more tech i mean a bit technicalities that okay why classical lower bounds i mean there's a stun give el this result and so on so forth what we need to do so yeah so if you have any question just let me know but yeah so i'll just reiterate before moving on what we showed is that this polynomial you define this pd which is just 3d variables x1 xd plus y1 yd plus z1 zd we showed that this requires exponential size exponential size sigma 2 pi sigma bar circuit okay and this is essentially showing that and this can be shown for any arbitrary k you can i mean you can just for k uh, just general k you have to add more more such kind of polynom uh, monomials like for example for k equal to 3 you add again some something like w1 wd so for constant k you just add k you write this k plus 1 times d variables kind of thing and then yeah so this that just works okay so if uh, no one has any question then let's just uh, try to move forward okay so the first point is uh so first point is what is the i mean why even k equal to 2 is hard in the border right the first point is uh, there can be non trivial cancellations and that of course first of all makes things harder there are other difficulties as well i'll come to that but just just see an example for example let's just look at t1 and t2 right it's just linear things now look at if you look at t1 minus t2 you look at the first three terms gets cancelled because they are essentially same in t1 and t2 and if you now look at epsilon equal to 0 something like x3 minus x4 will come out and this non trivial cancellations is very hard to capture it's not it's not clear how to capture this cancellations and that sort of already makes things harder the second point that i want to make clear is this interesting identity so look at this identity x square is x minus epsilon to the m by 2 times x plus is epsilon to the m by 2 a mod epsilon to the m and this holds for any a in the field right so now think of this as the first product get t1 second think of this as a t2 the second product now what is t1 minus t2 limit i mean by 1 by epsilon to the m so you can think of the x square by epsilon to the m as t1 and this guy by epsilon to the m as t2 right and then if you look at limit t1 minus t2 it is a square what does that really imply that implies that i mean there could be infinitely many factorizations and that could essentially give infinitely many limit points 
So you cannot expect to work over this Chinese remendering or this Hensel lifting kind of idea and say that, okay, I mean, we, we study this and understand the limit because this is, this is really, I mean, there can be infinitely many limit points and it's not even, I mean, it's not a pretty clear how to tackle this. And the second point is, of course, this is just k equal to two. I mean, for k large, larger k, when this kind of thing becomes even more complicated and easier. So it's not clear. So this is one aspect of why k equal to two, even in the border is hard. This is because, as I said, infinitely many factorizations can happen. So infinitely many limit points can happen. Now, the second point, which is even more crucial to our thing is that why this classical uh, uh, kind of thing does not lift in the border. And essentially what we say is that non-homogeneity is really bad. And I'll, I'll say what I really mean by non-homogeneity. So let's just look at L1, a, poly a linear polynomial as one plus epsilon times X1, okay? Remember the, uh, the classical proof, if you recall the classical proof, what we were doing was we were really looking at mod L1, right? Mod uh, this ideal and we were looking at this mod L1. But what does it mean to look at mod L1 in the border? So essentially what, what we are saying is we want to make L1 zero. That means we want to put X1 equal to minus one by epsilon and then try to understand what is happening in epsilon tends to zero. In other words, in terms of ideal, what is happening is that I want my L1, of course, and I also I want epsilon tends to zero, which is essentially saying that I want to make epsilon zero. So I am working with L1 comma epsilon. Now, interestingly, this ideal has element one in, inside it. So that means working mod this I does not even make sense. So for this kind of L1, the proof just breaks down. There is nothing you can do, okay? So as I said, the, the, the lesson, les, what is the lesson? The lesson is that if we blindly try to leave the classical proof in the border, this just fails. There is no way you can work this simple proof. I mean, if you remember the proof, essentially we show that I want to write K plus, if I have K plus one sort of inner product left-hand side, in the right-hand side, I have sum of K many product of linear polynomials. I eventually look at mod L1, then mod L1, L2, mod L1, L2, L3, and so on. I'll ultimately take K many polynomials. And I say that, okay, right-hand side is zero, left-hand side is robust, so cannot be non-zero, so done. The problem is that this doesn't even make sense in the border because for when your, let's say L1 is this, and eventually all L Li's can be this, right? What you will do? So this is exactly the point that I'm trying to make. So the worst case that could happen is that when each TI has factors of this form one plus epsilon LI, then there is no mod and so on. This is no this business because this just miserably fails. There is no mod ideal and so on because the concept does not even make sense there, right? So then it already shows that you need something non-trivial, some non-trivial idea here to work, okay? Good. So. Uh, now I want to sort of, uh, so this talks about non homogeneous So why this is non homogeneous Because there is this one that is sitting, right? One plus epsilon. This one is really making this non homogeneous kind of things. So now I want to, in this slide, claim that non homogeneity is really what you need to care about. In other words, I want to sort of intuitively convince you that um, if you have some linear, linear forms which is homogeneous in these TIs, then our life is easier. So all we really have to take care is the last case where a plus epsilon is T1 plus T2 where each TI is really non-homogeneous. Each factor is one plus epsilon times L. So let's just see this for K equal to two. I'll not sketch this for larger K because that lem I mean, that is a technical lemma and needs quite a lot of things, but essentially you will get the idea of what we are doing. So for k equal to two, there are three cases that kind of one needs to consider. First case, let me write this all these cases so that you can read. First case is each t1 and t2 has at least one factor, which is for linear form. There can be other factors. So let's say you pick t1, t1 can have factors, which is of the form one plus epsilon l, l. I don't care. But as long as it has at least one linear 
form Li, let's say x1 plus epsilon times x2. This is a homogeneous linear form, right? So let's say each Ti has this kind of factor. So this is my case one. My case two, case two is T1 has one linear form as a factor where T2 is all non-homogeneous kind. This all one plus epsilon times L kind of thing, T2. And T3, uh, and the case three is the worst case that I said, each T, T1 and T2 has all the one plus epsilon times L kind of factors. There is nothing uh, linear form that is going on, okay? So these are the only three cases that is possible. So I want to really convince you that case one and case two, if that happens, then our life is easy. We don't really have to look at that. And all we have to care about all non-homogeneous. So in the first case, if T1 and T2 has linear forms, let's say L1, L2, and remember I was saying that you have to include this epsilon, then since these are linear forms, there is no one plus epsilon Li kind of thing in L1, one cannot be in this ideal. And that is nice. Then, then this mod I really makes sense. There is nothing wrong in taking mod I. But the problem with the previous case was when it was one plus epsilon times L, one was sitting in the ideal, so it was the whole thing. So mod I does not make sense. But as long as these are linear forms, strictly linear forms, this does make sense. And you can show that this polynomial PD mod I cannot be zero. Whereas RHS, which is T1 plus T2, so mod L1 makes T1 zero, mod L2 makes T2 zero, so RHS is really zero, which is a contradiction. So first case, cannot even happen. Now, if you, if you look at the second case, second case is T1 has a linear factor and you do not take anything from T2. Now, if you look at mod I, what essentially you are doing is you are killing T1 and you are surviving this T2 survives. And what is T2? T2 is of the form pi sigma, right? So if you look at mod I, that means if you look at epsilon tends to zero, this is really pi sigma bar, which is pi sigma. And you can show that PD mod I cannot be pi sigma. So again, for the first two cases where at least one factor is linear form, you can still work with mod I and so on and so forth, at least for k equal to two. So then the last case is all non-homogeneous. All factors are of the form one plus epsilon L and you want to, you want to really understand what is, how to show lower bound for this. And uh, as I already probably mentioned that for k greater than two, almost this scenario happens that case one and case two can happen, but you can show that, I mean, you can handle it in some way or the other and always reduce this to case three. So all you really have to care is each Ti is strictly non homogeneous. It is of the form one plus epsilon Li kind of, okay? But you will not get into, I mean, k greater than two, uh, these technicalities and so on. We'll just restrict ourselves to k equal to two because as you can see, this, these two cases are really easy when k equal to two. So all known homogeneous is all we have to care. So any questions still now? Okay, so if there is no question, let's go to, uh, let's go to the, First uh, roadmap, what we are really going to do. Let's say, I mean, again, we know that T1 plus T2 is PD plus epsilon times some S. Ti is a product of linear forms, linear polynomials, and we are in the all non homogeneous factors. That means each Ti has factors of the form 1 plus epsilon times L. Now, the idea is, as Nitin has already mentioned, I think in his previous two talks, that reduce fan in 2 to reduce 1, which such some nice form. And uh, we use a map, which is a really scaling map, which really sort of scales Xi to some Z times Xi. Okay, this I'll talk about a bit late, but what, what, is the, what is the significance of this Z? Z is really a degree counter. So we will apply this scaling map and we will use what we did in the previous uh, work, which is, uh, uh, where we develop this DDL technique, divide, derive, interpolate with limit. But as I said, this we can only do after some 
reprocessing. I'll also clarify these things in the next slide. But what is the overall goal what I want to show? I want to really show that if PD has a small S size approximately circuit, they have three fan into circuits, all non-homogeneous, then we, I want to claim that we can show PD has border wiring length small, or maybe if PD, I mean, yeah. So PD has border wiring length small. We want to claim that, okay? And uh, the contradiction will follow from the fact that wiring rank of PD or border wiring rank of PD is really exponential in D. So then S has to be really exponential. That's the high level map of this. And remember, I want to just clarify again one thing. It is easy to show wiring rank of PD using partial derivative measures. And partial derivative measure is essentially rank based method. You essentially look at the uh, dimension of the space. So this is the rank based, and then easily this can be lifted to border. So that essentially again implies that border wiring rank of PD is exponential in, H, in D. And this essentially shows that S is exponential. Okay. So now, uh, if the roadmap is clear, let me quickly go into. I mean, one could ask that, okay, I mean, if you are doing essentially doing DDL, then why DDL directly fails, right? That is an obvious question. Now, I just want to, um, I just want to sort of give a brief idea of how DDL worked. Now, essentially, what we did was, Again, for DDL to work, we started with the scaling map and the shifting. And this random shift was required. And why it was required? To actually, essentially, I mean, this is such kind, of, kind of a funny thing. So we really wanted non things to be non-homogeneous there. Okay? Because we eventually wanted to use this one by one minus Z kind of thing, because this has power series. But if it is like one by Z or something, this does not exist. So these kind of cases we wanted to avoid. That's why we just shifted. But the problem is that if you shift and start with this work, ultimately, I mean, if, if someone knows the proof, or it's, it's a bit technical, but just say that if, if you have read the proof or this, if you just go through the proof, you will see that ultimately you will get something like derivative of PD by something. is a product fan in times a border wiring, something like that. The main point is that we do not really know how to show lower bound on this kind of models. Okay, it's not even clear because there is a product. I mean, there's a circuit. This is inside, and you are again taking a derivative, and then this is a convolution. I mean, it's it's really bad. So it's not clear how to show lower bound on this. And even k greater than two is even harder because essentially we had to interpolate and find uh, go back to the original polynomial. So k greater than two even harder so there is no point of talking about this so as i said for the upper bound shifting was required but for lower bound shifting is problematic so there is this kind of dichotomy that is help this kind of contradictory things that is so how to really resolve and as i said the real the proof is really about pre-processing so you pre-process process you had this case one case two case three right and essentially you showed that uh, essentially, you showed that case three is all you have to care. For the larger k, it is not that obvious, but you can pre-process and show that ultimately all non-homogeneous cases all you have to worry about, and there is no shift. And that pre-processing does not require shift. It is some kind of projection, but inductive sort of proof. It is a bit technical. I'm not going into that, but you can uh, show all non-homogeneity, and then. And then once you have all non homogeneous then you use GDL. Then this, this proof sort of works, okay? So uh, how much time I have? Oh, I have five minutes, okay. So, um, okay, so I'll what I'll really do is probably go very fast of what I'm really doing. I don't know whether this makes sense because this will maybe confuse, but the, Point of DDL, if, if you remember, is divide, derive. Can I first do D, two Ds first, derive, divide and derive. So what do we really do is derive, divide by T2 and then def differentiate by this variable Z. So that is why we call this divide and derive. And then essentially we say that 
after differentiation this is sort of a fan in one but this is a complicated this this one is a complicated structure but we essentially show that this g1 has a nice structure so i'll not really go into uh this technicality because i think this is this will this is too messy i'll i'll put it up in my web page if someone wants to see the sketch but i think let's not get into this proof because this is 5 minutes is too less yeah i just want to mention one point if you remember uh l in our case in all non homogeneous case l is of this form 1 minus z times l right because it was 1 plus epsilon times l and if you scale it by xi goes to z times xi it is essentially 1 minus z times l and what is d log what d log is essentially derivative of 1 minus zl by 1 minus zl and derivative of 1 minus zl with respect to z is just l or minus yeah minus l and this has a nice sigma wave sigma for depth diagonal kind of thing and this is exactly what what we use i'll not go into that but ultimately what you will show is um uh, there will be pi sigma by pi sigma if you if you if you go through the uh, upper bound proof all, all, also we had this pi sigma by pi sigma times sigma over sigma but there we had no control over pi sigma but here we have control over pi sigma because each factor is of the form 1 plus epsilon li so when epsilon is zero this is like a constant so really this guy does not matter so how, what what really it will give is just sigma over sigma bar so then essentially you It, this proof will give you that uh, this after scaling this is has small uh, sigma wave sigma bar or border varying has small that means a pd has small border varying and if you remember the proof we showed that i mean you know, using partial derivative measure you can show that pd has large varying rank this really implies that the s circuit has to be exponential so this is the whole i mean sort of very very brief overview of what we are really doing okay so i'll just conclude uh, quickly so our proof uh works for k constant on in fact k small log n if in, in fact is works but it does not give exponential lower bound it essentially gives sub exponential lower bound but yeah this uh can we actually show can we extend this k right and the other kind of thing is that we showed talked about def3 can we extend this to def4 but restricted def4 so this is essentially sum of product of univariate polynomials and then you are so k many sum of product of univariate polynomials and you are closing it you are taking the border can we show exponential lower bound for this okay and uh, the, the the other interesting thing would be to actually look at def4 circuits where you are restricting the bottom fan in to some constant but not delta equal to 1 remember delta equal to 1 is really def3 sigma pi sigma right but now we are saying that what about delta 2 or in any fixed constants can we show such kind of uh, 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 lower bounds i mean this kind of hierarchy it's not clear okay so yeah so yeah so that's how i want to stop uh, last bit i sort of skimmed a bit quickly because i think otherwise it would have been very messy but i hope that you got the overall idea so yeah so now i'll i mean if you have any questions that i'll like oh, yeah was like uh, <laughs> um so are there questions anjal can you also do pit for this model Oh, which model? This border of sigma pi sigma bounded fan. Ah, uh, sigma the depth three or depth four? What are you are talking about? Depth three. Depth three. Depth three sigma pi sigma border. Right. Ah, uh, for with constant of fan, yes, you can do. Okay. With depth three, yes, you can do. But. but the catch is that you have we you can do only quasi polynomial time i mean okay. in the classical setting there is a uh, polynomial time known i mean without border but with the border you have only quasi polynomial time known okay mm -hmm.